Hello and welcome to 1 Samuel 28. We're going to pause at the beginning of 1 Samuel 28 and read two verses which originate the phrase, too clever for your own good. We left the end of 1 Samuel 27 with David seemingly choosing the lesser of two evils. That is, lying and deceiving his way into the grace of the king of Gath, but without actually hurting his own people, but going after Israel's ancient enemies, but doing it in such a way that called into question his godliness and wisdom. So David chose the lesser of two evils, hopeful to avoid the scenario where he was called into actually warfare against Judah, against his own people, that he had already been told by God through Samuel that he would be the king over. And now we have this problem coming up at the start of 1 Samuel 28. And it is a great example of being too clever for his own good, too clever by halves. He was so good at being a deceiver, so good at lying, that the king of Gath started to assume that David could actually help him in a war against Israel. In fact, it seems like the Philistines started this war because they had the added help of someone like David. So 1 Samuel 28 begins with these words, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Archish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. In other words, there are no neutral bystanders in a war. There are no Switzerlands in a war in the ancient world when there's two parties involved. You have to join one of them, especially if it's in the territory you're currently living in. And so Archish has said, you're here with us. You will fight with us and for us against your other enemy, namely Saul. David's reply is, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Now David's trying to be deliberately deceptive and non-committal, but it's not exactly encouraging if you're a Saul in his army. It seems like we are asking ourselves the question, has David gone over to the other side? Has he become one of the dark forces against God's people? It's left up in the air, isn't it? The question we probably will end up asking ourselves is, how on earth is David going to get out of this one? He's been cunning and clever, but a lot of this cunning and cleverness is his own thought processes. And over time, we get into the idea that whenever David is cunning and clever without reference to God, it doesn't turn out very well for him, especially in the short term. This is a great theme of 2 Samuel, and we're being introduced to that cleverness and cunningness of David but a cleverness and cunningness that is separate from asking God for wisdom and understanding. We all can be clever and cunning and make decisions that are wise in our own eyes, which is what David had been doing, but not asking them in reference to God's character and how God can actually be the God who holds David safe. David didn't need to hold himself safe. Well, what happens there? Continues on, at the end of that verse, it says this, Archish replied, very well, so Akish has got the problem of hearing uh, things through his own perceptions. So he has been duped by David with the lies that David had been, if you like, scouting the edges of Israel and taking territory on behalf of the Philistines. But in reality, he'd been taking other territory on behalf of himself. But Ziklag was not able to communicate and neither were the other places. Because when David invaded places, he left no one alive to come and communicate to Archish that exactly what he'd been doing. And so Archish had thought, David is on my side, or at least he's on his own side, and that is against Israel now. He's become a stench to them. They won't support him. But of course, that was not the case. And so when he says very well here, we are led to think, oh no, Archish is a fool. He's been duped because he wants to go to war against Saul. The Philistines for the last 20, 30 years have absolutely been crushed by David and by Saul at various times, and they have the opportunity now to get revenge. And so when Archish has a heart and eyes set for revenge, he only sees the world through his own lenses, a problem that we all have. 
We can see the world through our own perceptions, our own glasses, our own ways of thinking. When our eyes and hearts are hell-bent on one direction, we interpret the world through the ways that we want to go, never asking ourselves the question whether this is actually wise or correct. This is Arkish's problem, and we'll see that it has disastrous consequences later. He says, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now, in the original language, there's a sense of irony here. It's basically saying, I'm going to make you, David, as the in charge over my own head. In other words, you're in charge of caring for me. Now, that has two connotations. Firstly, that I'm going to put you so close to me. But the reason he's doing that could be because he trusts David. Again, a sign of Arkish's uh, futile, futile thinking. But it's also uh, harkening back to how David treated the Philistines in his first ever meeting. That is, he cut off the head of the soldier of Gath called Goliath. So again, is David transferred his allegiance so much that, that he's gone from cutting off the head of the Philistines to actually protecting the head of the Philistines? Or is Arkish the one who has been absolutely duped by David's duplicity? The answer is we don't know at this point. It seems like both could be true. Because what we're seeing here is two men who are absolutely making decisions outside of God. First, David. He's duplicitous, he's deceiving, he's cunning, he's clever, but he's too clever for his own good because he's only looking out for his own good. He's not consulting God, he's not asking God. And that's going to be a great question that we follow on for the rest of 1 Samuel 28. That is, what does it mean to ask God? And that'll be for our next theme. And the problem for Arkish when you have evil intentions, when you have vengeance, when your heart is set on a particular desire, you often interpret the entire world and other people's motives through your own desires and what enables you to achieve what you want. We've got to stop, pause, ask ourselves the question, the way I see the world, is that correct? Or is it only understood because I'm seeing it through my own eyes? We've got to ask ourselves, I need to see it through God's eyes, not merely our own. Amen.